Nobody ever become wealthy by chance. You never achieve anything by accident. You have to focus, be smart and work towards making yourself somebody. Those words are so, so true. I lived it, Joshua. I didn't know anything about newspapers 29 years ago. Today, I can say without boasting, I can teach many of the scholars about news and newspaper business, which, which I have already done with so many that is in the field of journalism today. Name them, Joshua, in Guyana. Not the foolish ones. No, not them. And I can tell you the role I played in making them who they are today. Including editors and columnists. Not calling names. In this type of business. Joshua, in this type of business, every moment we learn, something new. I smiled yesterday when a friend said, Glenn, never argue with a fool, for the onlookers may not be able to tell the difference. <laughs> and with that, with that said, I just want to say namaste to all you beautiful and hardworking people. Namaste. Every day, guys, we here at the Kaicho News have been reporting on the foolishness that both governments did and are still continuing to do to this land or in this land. With each passing day, we can't help but inform you people about the foolishness and blatant corruption and sellout of our resources. Yes, our wealth. One African guy, one African guy said, we elect clowns and then give them the seat of the headmaster's office. You have that tape? Play it quickly for me. Thanks. One of Africa's biggest chances is that Africans Oh, I love that piece of tape. That's a piece of um, WhatsApp I received from a friend in Africa. One of Africa's biggest cancer is that Africans, for whatever reason, seems insistent in electing leaders who have built nothing and then wonder why they built nothing. They build nothing. They create nothing. But with the ability to sing a tune, or sing a verse, or to fill a stadium with poor people, all with the promise of a food hamper and a t-shirt, and then you vote for them. <laughs> then you wonder why they don't know how to build a road, a house, or balance a budget, or ensure law and Order is in place. 
<laughs> oh boy, that guy couldn't say it better than Glenn. We elect fools and then put them in the seat of the headmaster's office. <laughs> wow. I had to share that piece with you guys. Last week at the oil conference, Dr. Ashni Singh, one of Guyana's financial gurus said, Guyana is now in a better position to take more loans. Yes, we are in a better position to take more loans. When we are now considered the richest and fastest growing economy on earth, Poor person. Hmm. Guys, this reminds me of the many stories I've experienced in life. Allow me to just share one or two with you guys tonight. Here we go with the first one. A weed a man won a hundred million lottery a few years back. And when a businessman heard that his weed a man won the cash, never know where this man lives, but meet the next morning before the weed a man could wake up at his shack. Hmm. Call him out and say, buddy, you know, you and your family can't live in this shack anymore with the kind of money you win. Bandits will come and kill all of your faith. Yes. Yes, boss, I know. The businessman didn't even allow the weed man to brush his teeth or bathe. He tell the man to put on your clothes and let's go have breakfast at the Pegasus. So that I can give you advice how to manage and spend that money wisely. Uncle and auntie, you know what happened? That poor fella went home drunk that evening. And again, early the next morning, the businessman was back at the weed man home before the guy could wake up. And took him out again for more drinks and breakfast. This went on for a few days. Till he draw down the hundred dollar, the hundred million lottery money. Long story short, the businessman sell him a twenty million property for forty five million in a residential area. Not long after, the property gone, the lottery money finish, the man broke. And he's back weeding on the roadside presently. Owing the same businessman that had to turn back and lend him money to buy the weeding machine he now using. I am not going to call name, but that's a very true story. I share that incident with all of you just to remind you that there's an old saying. A fool and his money shall soon part ways. I know many of you know that. Well, that is the exact position Guyana finds itself in for the last 30 years with both governments. And with each passing day, it's getting more and more horrible and terrible. We have so much today in our laps. That instead these guys go after and get what is rightfully ours. So that we can pay off our debts. And really build a country that can become better than Dubai. These clowns talking about Guyana is in a better place to borrow more loans. Please play that tape for me quickly. Let them hear. I want you guys to hear him in his own words. Play it. On the subject of fiscal solvency, it would be remiss of me not to mention, at least very briefly, 
the remarkable progress that we've made in strengthening the public finances over the years. Those of you who've been following Guyana for long enough would know that there was a period just about maybe 30 years ago when Guyana's public debt to GDP exceeded six times the size of the economy. In fact, in 1991, 1992, the public debt to GDP ratio exceeded 600%, was in fact, well, went as high as 617% of GDP, public debt as a percentage of GDP. We've been able over the years to bring public debt down, and today, Guyana's public debt to GDP ratio stands at 24.6%. Now, I didn't, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't put a chart up to, with uh, international comparators, but if you, I mean, many of you are familiar with these numbers, you track them around the world, you will no doubt recognize that a debt-to-GDP ratio of 24.6% in fact places Guyana ahead of almost every economy, certainly in this hemisphere, and puts us in a position where we actually have fairly significant headroom to borrow. Mm -hmm. Hmm, headroom to borrow. Giving away US billions in our oil, selling out billions in our minerals and forestry for a few pennies, and now saying we are in a better position to borrow US billions to further sink us into more debts. Father above. Please come quick and help this drowning nation from these fellas. A quick laugh before we get back to serious business, uncle. Today, about eight men gang up at the Georgetown Hospital saying they don't want renegotiation anymore. They want ring fencing. One man said, if he radio not working, he will shy it away in the Demara River. And even if he got to go to America to bring one to listen to the Glen Lal show, he will do it. Listening to that man, how can I not continue doing what I'm doing? It makes my heart smile. That message. Smile at the message is finally getting somewhere and everywhere. Thanks, guys. You guys see why Vice President Jack Deo got to sit down with a gaff man, not with the real press for 63 minutes, and out of that 63, 48 minutes calling Glenn a madman. Mm-hmm. Exposing these things, showing you guys the light, educating you people as to what they're doing to your present and future is aggravating them, interfering with their sleep, playing with their heads, so much so that they're feeling, they're feeling for and stuttering for words to call me names. Let me say this to all of you tonight. I will not be moved from my purpose in life. I have rolled up my sleeves and I'm ready to make the sacrifices needed to inform, educate, and entertain you all as to the happenings in this land, which is so, so badly needed at the present moment in our history. Guys, this is not, this is not Glenn Lal's work. This is the man above direction. I am just the messenger. And the message, the message got them on their back foot. Raj, did I say namaste? Now I'll say namaste once again. And let's go back to Friday's Kaicho News lead story. Guyana in a better position to take more loans. So said, and you heard, the finance minister Ashni Singh. 
Mm -hmm. You guys listen to his fancy language. I want to play it back for you people. Play it back for them. On the subject of fiscal solvency, it would be remiss of me not to mention, at least very briefly, the remarkable progress that we have made in strengthening the public finances over the years. Those of you who've been following Guyana for long enough would know that there was a period just about maybe 30 years ago when Guyana's public debt to GDP exceeded six times the size of the economy. In fact, in 1991, 1992, the public debt to GDP ratio exceeded 600%, was in fact, well, went as high as 617 percent of GDP, public debt as a percentage of GDP. We've been able over the years to bring public debt down, and today, Guyana's public debt to GDP ratio stands at 24.6 percent. Now, I didn't, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't put a chart up to, with uh, international comparators, but if you, I mean, many of you are familiar with these numbers, you track them around the world, you will no doubt recognize that a debt to GDP ratio of 24.6% in fact places Guyana ahead of almost every economy, certainly in this hemisphere, and puts us in a position where we actually have fairly significant headroom to borrow. Headroom to borrow. Significantly headroom to borrow. Let me simplify what he said there for you guys, uncle. He said those of you who have been following Guyana would know that the country was in a bad shape 30 years ago under the PNC. We had big debts on our shoulders and the PPP came in and were able to clean up the mess. But we still have some debts that we can manage. When he talk about Guyana had six times the debt of the economy, he simply means, uncle, everything Guyana own, produce, and work for. The money we had owed was six times that. Now, Everything we own and working for, we only owe a quarter. So we're there in a good shape. That's what he means. So we're in a better position to borrow more. He then get a big round of applause after he said that. You guys heard a round of applause. <laughs> he went on to say, other countries... Economy in this hemisphere is far worse off than Guyana. So this gives us the headroom to borrow more. Hmm. That's basically what he said to justify more borrowing in the fastest growing country on earth. He also said our public debt stands at 3.6 billion US dollars. That was reported in the Friday Kaicho News. Now let me say this to all of you, Uncle and Auntie. Had Guyana sell, forget the Starbrook block, had Guyana sell the Kaicho and Kanji oil blocks alone in a clean sale in the open market, by now, he would have never had that three, we would have never had that 3.6 billion debt. And everybody's salaries would have been tripled, including pension packages. Notice, I ain't said nothing about Starbrook Block. Had that been sold too, in a proper fashion, man, Guyanese would have been kings and queens already. Living better than the people in Dubai and Kuwait. And that is only selling of the oil blocks I am talking about. Had we gotten the same deals, what do white people does get with their oil blocks? Yeah. By now we would have been ruling the world with money. We would have been giving the IMF 
War Bank and the IDB plus the CDB money to lend the world. I only hope you guys understand the wealth that has been discovered in this land so far. What Exxon telling us? Presently about 11 billion barrels. Uncle and auntie. They may even begin to start telling you the kind of oil that they out there. And every one of our leaders know this. <laughs> oh my. To sit down here and listen to Ashni Singh saying that Guyana is in a better position for borrow more money on this starving nation is not only painful for my heart, it aggravates my soul and brutalizes my mind. Over three quarter billion people in Africa and Asia don't have simple toilet facilities, running water, a clean cup of drinking water, electricity for their children to study, proper health care, or able to put food on their tables or clothes to wear. Guys, and they are not poor countries. They are rich countries. Richer than Guyana and many parts of the world. Uncle, you may still want to ask how these people find themselves in such a terrible state in which they are living day to day in rags and hopelessness. Leaders. Yes, leaders like what we have here. Joining hands with foreigners, helping and encouraging them to exploit us, cheat us, rob and rape us of every cent we have. Why? Why would leaders do this to their people? Why would they so blatantly sell out their children's lunch kits? our future dreams, and that of our good life. I find this, I find this thing many days and nights hard to comprehend, difficult to accept that is actually happening in this 21st century in a country where I was born. I find it very difficult. You guys see why I love today's travels and technology? Every one of you can see and hear for yourselves what has happened in all <coughs> the third world countries in this universe today and yesterday. Look how simple I am bringing all this information to your ears and eyes so that you can have a full understanding of what these leaders are about. Please, let's move away from Ashni Singh for a moment. Because he couldn't have said one word of what he said there without the blessings and clearance from his bosses. One of his bosses, by now all of you know, is Vice President Jack Dale. A man who was president for 11 years now. Yes, 11 years. Now in charge of the biggest thing in this hemisphere. Bigger than the region, our oil. All of us know Jack Dale is not a stupid guy. He knows everything I say on this radio and in the newspaper is factual about what the Guyanese people must know. Yet, instead he come and sit with me and the mainstream media on a regular basis to have a frank discussion on the way he's managing the resources of this land. Hmm. How, how we can put our heads together and get the best out of it for every Guyanese. 
he chooses to go in the opposite direction, in a back alley, in a dark hole, with unprofessional gaff men to cuss out and abuse out and call people names. Instead of him meeting with the opposition guys, to put their heads together, to avoid this country becoming Africa or Asia, he prefers to also attack the opposition people. You heard Ashni Singh. He went back to 1991 and 1992, 31 years ago. You think that was by accident? No, man. No. That is exactly how they want to keep you, the Guyanese people, divided, looking back, lashing out, and always losing out. The PNC also, guys, is no different. Let me get a one straight and out of the way. Uncle, this day and age, with the kind of wealth this land has, man, we should be hugging each other, kissing each other, knocking glass with each other to figure out how we can get the most and best of the deals from what God Almighty has blessed us all with. That's what we should have been doing. But when last you hear President Ali, Barajak Deo, the PNC or the, or, the P, or the AFC say anything with the same voice on this great wealth of ours. When last you hear them say one good word about each other. Man, the foreigners in this country, more so the white people and the Chinese people, must be singing, dancing, and drinking to hell, heaven and back. Yeah, I'll continue with this kind of attitude. This country is going to get somewhere. Yesterday, I attended a wedding ceremony on the West Coast, and I was so happy at that wedding house. Everybody was in loud praise for the work I am doing. What made me even more proud was an ordinary fellow. In my mind, from his speech, he's not too much of a smart or educated person. But when he said, Mr. Glenn, I listen to your program, and every word you say is correct, <laughs> and don't want to even stop giving me pong, man, it's really uplifting. I realize, I am beginning to realize how this program is touching people's hearts and, and minds. Now you tell me, uncle, if I can do this to those people, why? What am I saying here that is not moving the leaders of this land? To act in good faith and in the best interests of this, this starving nation. Can somebody tell me? Help me to understand. Help me to understand what is going through President Ali's head. When he got all the trump cards of the entire pack of playing cards to bring about in his hands, uncle. To bring about major changes and he's not doing it tell me not even making an effort not even taking a step or opening their mouths to ask just ask for a better deal in which the lopsided contract gives them leeway to ask guys help me to understand that what on earth these oil people have done to these Guyanese leaders? That not one of them, in government or in opposition, have opened their mouths 
raised their hands and said, Exxon, this nation needs a much better deal with this oil wealth. Hmm? Not one of them is pushing for what should be their biggest priority in this country. To help lift every Guyanese out of poverty and the life they're living. Isn't it time, brothers and sisters, that President Ali, the man who's heading the Republic of Guyana, say or do something about his highway robbery and highway seize piracy that is going on in this country, brother? He should. He should. This is high sea piracy going on in this land. He should say something. Instead of him doing that, guys, listen how President Ali is driving fear into the Guyanese people. I played him before, and I guess some of you people missed what he said. So I'll play him back again. Listen. Instead of he fighting for us to get a better deal from this lopsided contract, he becomes a tout for the oil companies, reassuring them that he will not touch the contract or even ask for a little something more. You would hear him again saying he is leading a responsible government and how he will abide and honor the contract signed by the coalition. Not touching it. Yes, that's set in stone, uncle. Mm -hmm. In which the cement don't get hard. It can't move or it can't break. You will also hear him say, yes, dishonor the agreement. Plug up the well or go to court. <coughs> he said, look at our neighbors. About agreements that were not honored and see the consequences. Could you please play him? We are responsible government. A country does not turn off when one government comes in and another government comes out. That is why there are consequences of bad government and there are successes of good government. But when you inherit agreements, you have to work with them to the best of your ability. So we have some choices. Where are we? In looking at it, you have choices. Very, very elementary choices according to some. Dishonor the agreement and go to court. Plug up the wells or one party say, no problem. It's not far-fetched. Look around us, our neighbors, about agreements that were not honored. And see the consequences. <laughs> My gosh. What consequences President Ali talking about? And which neighbor he's talking about? Can somebody ask him to name them? I don't know of any country that has suffered consequences for asking an oil company to have a discussion on renegotiation of a one-sided contract? Uncle, you guys have to ask him to name those neighbors he's talking about. Or if anyone, you know, he must call me after the program. The whole white world 
that has the best oil contracts on earth for their citizens with their own oil companies demanded and got windfall taxes just recently. What Guyana asked for? Nothing. So what consequences is this man talking about? Tomorrow, we are carrying a lead story in the Kaicho News that New Mexico, one of the states in America, is demanding 25% royalty from the oil companies. Not 20. They're getting 20. They want 25 now. Read it in the Kaicho News tomorrow. What consequences President Ali talking about to ask for a better deal from a one-sided contract man? Hmm? What is happening in this land? You guys realize what this guy is doing to this nation? He's trying to drive fear in all of us. Trying to tell us, hmm, touch the contract. And it's going to be big trouble for Guyana. Can you imagine this from the leaders? The leader of Guyana's mouth? A man who should have been fighting for its citizens. Yes. Fighting for the citizens' well-being and future prosperity. Driving fear in me and you. Let me ask this. You think President Ali and more so Vice President Jack Dale with all that brain in the head frightened to ask? Let me repeat it, man. Ask for a better deal? Knowing it's a one-sided contract? Huh? Is frightened really frightened? Well, if anyone here are so stupid to swallow that pill, then stop listening to this program. Go listen to them clowns that on the other radio stations and television stations. This is not being afraid or driving fear. What you just listened to from the mouth of our president, guys. Mm -mm. This, is the, this is the latest and clearest confirmation that President Ali has become the biggest tout and defender of Exxon and that contract rather than the protector and defender of me and you, the Guyanese people and our country. I have never heard Exxon threaten to take legal action or say they can carry me to court or even say there will be consequences if Guyana asks for something better on that lopsided contract. Here we have here we have our executive president Threatening consequences. Yes. We will face consequences if we ask. Buddy, give a wee something more. Buddy, give a wee something more. No? You will get consequences for that. Huh? Uncle, auntie. Open your mouth. Give away something more, nobody. You getting consequences for that? When the contract says it clear? 
Let me tell you another story we are carrying tomorrow. This government already renegotiated the oil, the gas contract. Yes. How come they not renegotiate the taxes and the royalties? And it's not Glenn saying this. A Tony at law, Christopher Ram saying it. That is the lead story tomorrow in the Kaicho News. You know, many days I tried to wrap my head around that man's behavior. His attitude and words. More so his leadership qualities. And can't comprehend why this is happening in this country. Why our leaders trying their best to come up with schemes and concoctions just not to confront Exxon. And at the same time, they don't want the nation to say a word about this U.S. trillion dollar oil sector. Man, I find this thing unthinkable, unimaginable, unbelievable. I don't know. But you know what, uncle? You know what, auntie? It's shut down. They want this discussion on oil to shut down. That is why you could have heard him so upset with me and you who are talking in the streets and in the rum shops about bringing about a change. Uncle, President Ali, Jagdeo Norton and Ramjatan don't want any kind of conversation about our wealth. We must just shut up. Yes. We must just shut up. I wanted to use a nice word. Shut the. Mm -hmm. You know the word. But I can't use it on the radio. <laughs> and take what you, and take what you get. That's what I want all of, all of us to do. A friend put it nicely this morning. Glenn, the politicians already dropped their clues to the oil companies. You know what I mean. And they want us to do the same. Hmm. My gosh. It is sad. What they say? Slavery and indentured ship done? Finish? Y'all wait till the oil and the gold. Mm -hmm. Your forestry done. That one word slavery. Yes. Wait. That one word slavery will be hanging all over our children and grandchildren's head. With a tiny, yes, with just a tiny few that will become masters. Wait till them things done. Just wait and see. And a few of them going to be the masters. Just like in the olden days when you had massa cracking the whips, keeping us in line. President Ali. And Jack Bill don't start. Both of them cracking the whip to keep us in line. Don't you dare open your mouth and say one word about that oil contract. If not, if not, I will bust your back. Hmm. Right now, I believe, and many others too, if they can do away with me, Get rid of me tomorrow morning. That would be the greatest gift they could ever wish for. But let me say this. I have a wish of my own too. No harm must be done to my leaders. 
and that they must be blessed with the will, courage, honesty, and wisdom to confront Exxon just to extract a better deal for all of us. Isn't that a beautiful wish, guys? Hmm? That's all I want. I think it's Monday and I have said a lot already. Let me end by saying this. Let's drop renegotiation of the oil contract for now. Listen to me carefully. Let's drop renegotiation of oil contracts for now. The coalition fell down badly and give away Lisa 1 and 2 without even securing the basic things in business like ring fencing, insurance, taxes, etc. The PPP government, Jack Dale himself, knowing all of that, went in there and gave Exxon the third and fourth projects still did not install taxes, ring fencing, insurance, and so on. Now the fifth project is pending for his signature. And the sixth project application is in the processing stage. <laughs> and guess what? They just announced the seventh project. Like I said, auntie, Let's drop the word renegotiation of the lopsided contract for the time being tonight. We are not touching there. We are not going there. The fifth and sixth projects is in Jack Dale's and President Ali's hands. This is the moment for them to show what they are truly made of. This is the time for them to use the trump cards to make Guyana a winner. Yes, a winner to lend money rather than borrow money. Let me repeat. In giving away the fourth project, the first four projects, sorry, Guyana will always be the loser. <laughs> <laughs> will always be a loser. There is no if or but about that. Let me make it more simple for you to understand what I'm saying. Had Jack Dale installed just ring fencing alone in Lisa 3 and 4, by now, this very moment, Guyana, all of us would have been getting the real half and half of every barrel of oil coming up from Lisa 1. <coughs> and in a few more mornings, <coughs> we also would have been getting the full half and half of every barrel from Lisa 2. <laughs> you know why, guys? Because we don't pay out all the expenses for Lisa 1 and half the expenses of Lisa 2. Like I said... In a few more mornings, we should have been getting full half and half profits, less the little expenses from every barrel of oil pumping from Lisa 1 and 2. Yes, with, that, with just that one single thing, ring fencing. Yes, but because Jack Dale didn't install ring fencing, in Lisa 3 and 4, we would have to live with half of a quarter bottle rum for the rest of our lives in those four projects. Let me repeat that, man. We will have to live with half of a quarter bottle rum, not half of a full bottle, for the rest of the oil, oil in those four projects. Please, please guys, shout at them. 
ring fencing, ring fencing, ring fencing. For fifth and sixth and every other project. <coughs> Please, I am begging all of you. Let your voices be heard in all the rum shops. The minibuses, the offices, the stores, the marketplaces. And everywhere you go, you must only, only be singing before you buy a bundle bore, uh, ring fence it. Ring fencing, ring fencing, ring fencing. This has nothing to do with renegotiation, uncle. We are not asking for a contract to be renegotiated. We are just asking for ring fencing alone on every other projects. Which could have already been bringing about betterment in this country. Man, with ring fencing, we wouldn't have been had to be talking about borrowing money. And in a few more mornings, had we had the ring fencing in Lisa 3 and 4, man, all of Guyana's debt would have already been paid off and this country would have been heading to becoming the Dubai of the Caribbean. With that one single thing alone, ring fencing, Uncle and auntie, with ring fencing alone, we can fix we country, the Caribbean, and stand on we own two feet, controlling we own destiny. And that is only one thing I'm talking about, ring fencing. Just imagine if these leaders demand from the oil companies taxes. Just imagine we leaders demand protection with full cover insurance. Imagine if we kept the interest rates we are paying out there. Control the amount of money them taking out for clean up. Verify and check all them inflated bills which has nothing also to do with renegotiation of that lopsided contract. Guys, then Guyana would have become the envy of the world with the life every one of us would have been living. Mm -hmm. You notice again, I am not talking about touching the lopsided contract or using that word defined so hateful renegotiation. I am not talking about renegotiation. That is off the table here tonight. Take that off we tongue. Take it out we minds. All we are talking about now, Mr. Ali and Mr. Jagdale, is installing those things that I just mentioned there, which can make Guyana super, super rich and into a superpower overnight. A superpower that the world would come to respect us. Let me repeat again. One, protection for our country and people is at the head of the list, uncle. Full liability coverage from the parent companies that they promise. Two, Ring fencing. That's the number two. Ring fencing. Of course, protection comes first. You got to protect your life. Then money. Ring fencing. That's the number two. That can really put billions of American dollars in our pockets. Three. Cap the interest rates. Hmm. That can also put billions in our pockets. Not Guyana dollar. American dollars. Four, collect with taxes. More billions there, uncle. 
five. Check, verify them inflated bills. Man, man, you wouldn't even have bank. You wouldn't even have bank for all the money we will be receiving. We will receive so much that we can pay off the entire region debts and still be super rich. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I forget the sixth. Control the decommissioning fund. The clean up money. Yes. Own the account. And you decide. We decide. Guyana decide how much money coming out. And going into the account. Man, uncle and auntie. If these superstars. <coughs> for leaders we have. Only do that. The world will be calling us super, super rich. Hmm. No government. No government. <coughs> wants you to become smart or wise. It is against. <coughs> it is against their devious plans. If you people become wise, they cannot be exploited and cheated. If they are intelligent, they cannot be controlled. They cannot be forced into a mechanical life to live like robots. They will assert their individual rights. They will have the fragrance of rebellionist in them as they would like to live in freedom. Freedom comes with wisdom, uncle. They are inseparable. And no government wants people to be free. No government would like people to use their own intelligence. Because the moment they start using their own wisdom, they become dangerous. Dangerous to the government. And dangerous to the people who are in power. Dangerous to the haves. Dangerous to all kinds of oppression, exploitation, suppression. Dangerous to the churches, to the counties, and to the nation as a whole. In fact, uncle, a wise man is a fire alive, a flame. He would rather die. Than be enslaved. Debt will not matter much to him, but he cannot sell his life to all kinds of stupidities, to all kinds of stupid people. He cannot serve them. Yes, those words I got from a man who did a TikTok. Beautiful words. When we become wise, yes, it's a problem for all of them. Hmm. Let's wait and see if the politicians love us, really care for us, and really want the best for all of us with those fifth and sixth projects. More so, Vice President Jack Dale, who is now the man put in charge to sign off these projects. Hmm. Guys, let's wait and see. And let me say this. If you do not fight for what you want, don't cry for what you lost. Nothing depends on luck. Everything depends on work. Because even luck has to work. That came from one of the holy books. Do have a great evening. You guys, Joshua, you guys notice the silence of the PNC, the AFC, and the PPP who is in government, and is now developing a campaign to protect the oppressors of this country. 
calling the people who speak out against this wholesale thievery a madman. Let me tell all of you this. Say nothing and do nothing. You will all become nothing. Mahatma Gandhi said, Be, be the change you want to see in the world. Glenn Lal is saying, Be the change you want to see in your own country first. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, I never forget this, and I will never forget this. Please don't forget this, Uncle and Auntie, brothers and sisters. What race you come from, never forget this. I love this quote from this man. He said, if we don't learn to live together as brothers and sisters, we will all perish together as fools. Then he went on to say, that same issue is facing all of us today. No individuals can live alone. No village, no county, no nation can stand alone. We are tied together. Don't fight together. We're going to all perish together. Please, we have to stop this bickering and fighting about who is Hindu, who is Muslim, who is Christian, who is Indian, who is African, who is Amerindian, who is PPP, who is PNC, who is KFC. We got to stop this thing. With that, I say God bless you guys.